Hi and welcome! In this video, we're going to introduce the concept of rational functions. So I'll start with the definition and then we'll work through some examples. So we say a rational function is a ratio of two polynomial functions. So I like to think the word rational has the word ratio in it, so you can think that a rational function has this ratio. And specifically, it's going to look like f of x equals p of x over q of x. Here, p and q are polynomials, and we also have to have the condition that q of x is not equal to zero. So this condition of being not equal to zero is necessary since we have a ratio or a fraction, and so we can't divide by zero. So in general, when we're doing division, dividing by zero is not allowed, and so we need q of x to not be zero. Okay, so this is our basic definition. Then we just need to talk through some more things about this. So since this includes a fraction, I'm going to be using the words numerator and denominator a lot. So numerator is the top of the fraction and denominator is the bottom of the fraction. So to be mathematically precise, I'll use the words numerator and denominator as often as possible, but just remember this is the top of the fraction and the bottom of the fraction respectively. Then to show you what rational functions can look like, we have a polynomial divided by a polynomial. So this could look as simple as one over x. One is a polynomial and x is a polynomial. Or we could have x squared plus five over three x minus two. We could have something written in factored form. So x minus four squared times x plus one, all divided by x minus three times x plus one times x plus two. Here, these are polynomials, so this is a rational function. And then the last example I'll show is x to the fifth minus x divided by x to the sixth minus 3x squared plus 9. So we'll go through the graphs of each of these examples, but I'll just talk quickly here about the domain and range. So because we can't divide by zero, the domain is going to be all real numbers, so everything except for when we would be dividing by zero. So except for where q of x, the denominator, is equal to zero. So we take all real numbers and we just remove the places where we would be dividing by zero because we don't want to include those in the domain. Then as you'll see with our graphs, the range is really going to depend on the rational function. There's no specific rule we can refer to. We'll just have to figure this out depending on the function itself. Okay, so let's look at some graphs. I just want to talk about some of the characterizing features of rational functions, and then in later videos we'll tell how to better identify these and be more precise. So let's start with 1 over x. To really give us a sense for what's going on, I'm actually going to plot quite a few values. So we have a table here with x and then f of x, which is 1 over x. So we'll do some inputs and outputs and look at what's happening. So I'm going to do 1, 2, 3, 1 half, 1 third, and 0. So starting with 1, when I put 1 in for x, I have 1 over 1, which simplifies to just be 1. So this is the point 1, 1 on the graph. Then when I put in 2, I have 1 divided by 2, which is just a half. So this is the point 2, 1 half. And this similarly happens with 3. So 3 gets mapped to 1 third. And so this is the point 3, 1 third. You can see as we continue to get larger values, we're just going to be having that fraction with one over that value each time. Then we can also input smaller values, so like 1 half or 1 third. When we do 1 half, we have 1 divided by 1 half. When we have this fraction in this way, we're going to multiply by the reciprocal. So I have 1 times 2 over 1. That 2 over 1 is the reciprocal then this simplifies to two. So this is the point one half two. So that input of one half provided a larger output based on how the fraction worked. Then for one third, I'll have one divided by one third. Again, we multiply by the reciprocal. So we have one times three over one, and that simplifies to three. So this is the point one third three. Then you can imagine if we made the input values negative, we would have the same calculations except the outputs would also be negative. So now I wanna talk about what happens at this x value of zero. So when we put zero in for x, we're getting one divided by zero. And this is exactly that location where we're dividing by zero, which is something we cannot do. So this value does not exist. 
zero is not in the domain of this function. And so at this value zero, we call this a vertical asymptote. This is a vertical line with the equation x equals zero. The function never touches this line, and that's because zero isn't a valid input for this function. So we call this a vertical asymptote, and this is one of our characteristics that often appears in rational functions, and that's because of this dividing by zero behavior. So we can explore this further by considering what happens as we approach zero. So what's happening as we get closer and closer to zero that's causing this behavior? So I want to substitute in some input values. Let's do 1 10th, 1 100th, 1 1,000th, and 1 10,000th. So we're trying to approach zero, getting closer and closer to zero from the right-hand side. As decimals, these would be 0 0.1, 0 0.01, 0 0.001, and 0 0.0001. So we're approaching zero. Now let's see what happens to the outputs. We can see on the graph that they're getting larger and larger, but let's try it with the table. So first let's input 1 tenth. I do one over 1 tenth. I'll multiply by the reciprocal, and so I'm just getting 10. Now when we input 1 one hundredth, I do one over 1 one hundredth. I multiply by the reciprocal, and I'm getting 100. So hopefully you're starting to see the pattern here. Next, we'll do 1 1,000th. This becomes 1,000 as the output. And then the input of 1 10,000th, when we do that multiplying by the reciprocal, we get 10,000. So as the x values approach 0, the output values go to infinity. So they're getting larger and larger and larger. So that's why this behavior is happening near the asymptote where we're never getting to that value of x equals zero, we're never reaching that line, we're just getting larger and larger output values. Now, a similar behavior is happening horizontally. If we look to the left and the right edges of the graph, we'll see that the outputs are approaching zero. So they never reach zero, but they're approaching zero. This is called a horizontal asymptote. And let's try this with some values to show you why this is happening. So I want to look to the right-hand side of the graph, and so I'll make my x values larger and larger, basically approaching positive infinity, which is on the right-hand side. So we'll do 10, 100, 1,000, and 10,000 as my inputs. So when we put these into our function 1 over x, first I get 1 tenth, that's 0 0.1. Then I get 1 one hundredth, that's 0 0.01. Then 1 one thousandth, 0 0.001 and 1 10,000th, 0 0.0001. So you can see these output values approach zero. So that's why the function, as we go to the very edge of the graph on the right-hand side, the output values approach zero, but they're never reaching it. There's no input value x that gives us zero as an output. So this is our horizontal asymptote, and the same thing would happen on the left-hand side with the negative input values. All right, so we have horizontal asymptotes and vertical asymptotes as one of our characteristics of rational functions. We'll talk more in a different video about how to find these more precisely. Then lastly, I just want to talk about the domain and the range. So the domain is everything except where we divide by zero. So that's actually at x equals zero. And you can see this with the vertical asymptote too. So we're going to do negative infinity to zero and zero to infinity. We're just taking out that x equals zero value. Then for the range, we have to just look at the graph to determine this. I'm seeing that there is no output value of zero. Basically, we're taking out that horizontal asymptote. At least that's what's happening in this case. And so I just don't want to include f of x or y equals zero. So this means we do negative infinity to zero and zero to infinity as my range. Okay, so hopefully you're getting a little sense for what sort of behavior can happen with rational functions. So whereas some of our other functions had pretty, I'd say, predictable behavior, you could kind of expect what a quadratic would look like, or even a polynomial has sort of somewhat predictable behavior, a rational function is a lot harder to just look at and tell what it's going to look like. So we often need to do more work to determine what's going on. Okay, let's look at x squared plus 5 divided by 3x minus 2. So here we can see that there's a vertical asymptote, and I know just from having the formula available to me that it's at x equals two-thirds. 
So our input value of two thirds is not allowed. We'd be dividing by zero if we did that. So that's our vertical asymptote, and this will affect our domain. So the domain is x is not equal to two thirds. We can't have that two thirds value. And so this means our domain is everything except that value. So negative infinity to two thirds unioned with two thirds to infinity. Then for the range, this function's a little unique. We have this sort of empty space in the middle of the graph if we go from bottom to top. And so just because I can use the graphing function to see what these values are, I'm able to get them precisely. So I'm seeing that we have from negative infinity to negative 10 ninths. That's that first point there. And then our output values start again at two and go to infinity. So here I'm just having to kind of look at the graph to get that information. Before we move on, I just want to note that this rational function did not have any horizontal asymptotes. So rational functions don't have to have horizontal asymptotes. This one happens to not have one at all. Okay, for our next example, we have the function x minus 4 quantity squared times x plus 1, all divided by x minus 3 times x plus 1 times x plus 2. So this function has a lot going on. Let's go through each part one at a time. So when I look at this graph, I'm first noticing that we have two vertical asymptotes. So there's an asymptote at 3 and an asymptote at negative 2. So these are the locations where the function is approaching, but it never quite reaches. So negative 2 is not a valid input to our function, and 3 is not a valid input. So our function never touches those lines, which are our vertical asymptotes. Then I also see that we have a horizontal asymptote. This one's more visible to me when I have access to the full graph because I'm able to zoom out, so you'll just have to trust me on this for now, that there is in fact a horizontal asymptote at y equals 1. So our function as we go to negative infinity and positive infinity, so the left and the right, is going to approach this value of 1. Then something new we have here is this undefined point. So this is at the value negative 1, negative 6. You can see this hole in the graph here. So I call these holes in the graph, they're also sometimes called removable discontinuities. It's just a place where the function is not continuous. There's a gap or a hole. Okay, so now we can talk about the domain and the range. So for our domain, we want to take out all the places where we would be dividing by zero. You can see in the formula that this is at three, negative one, and negative two. And this is going to line up with our vertical asymptotes and the whole. So we take out negative 2 for the vertical asymptote, we take out negative 1 for the hole in the graph, and we take out 3 for the vertical asymptote. So we'll just need to union together the pieces that don't include these values. So I do negative infinity to negative 2, unioned with negative 2 to negative 1, unioned with negative 1 to 3, and then 3 to infinity. So I'm basically just looking at the number line and taking out those points and writing all of the other intervals. Then for this function, the range is pretty hard to tell, honestly. I'm just going to leave that part of this out. We could go in and find the exact values. We need to determine a little bit more about the horizontal asymptote, like whether the function ever gets there. I don't think it does, but I'm just going to leave that part out for now, just knowing that you would look at the graph, get these exact values, and find the range. Okay, we have one more rational function to look at. So here, this is x to the fifth minus x divided by x to the sixth minus 3x squared plus 9. So something that is unique here is that we don't have any vertical asymptotes. So there's no vertical asymptotes, and there aren't any holes in the graph, but this is still a rational function. So don't think that a rational function needs those things. It doesn't have to have them. The ones we looked at so far just did. So what happens is that there actually are no values that make the denominator of the function equal to zero, at least not real valued ones. So we'd have to use complex numbers, which is not what we're doing right now. We're looking at just real numbers. And so our domain is actually going to be all real numbers. Then I just want to comment that I do see a horizontal asymptote. So the edges of the graph are approaching zero. You'll notice that in the middle of the graph, it does actually cross this horizontal asymptote, and that's fine. We're allowed to cross horizontal asymptotes. It just is a way to describe the very end behavior of the graph. So if we look to the left side and the right side of the graph, you can see the function output is approaching zero. 
So our range is going to be between those two points, the max and the min there, which because I have access to, I know is 0.514. So our range is from negative 0.514 to positive 0.514. So this is a sort of unique rational function. Doesn't necessarily look like what we'd expect, but it's still a rational function. All right, so that is an introduction into rational functions. Thanks so much for watching, and I will talk to you in the next one.